Hello everyone. Um, we are really excited to do this video, celebrate um, what's been accomplished in AERD and hopefully let you know a little bit more if this is a new diagnosis for you. Uh, so yeah. my name is Dr. Andrew White. I work at Scripps Clinic in San Diego and I'll let you introduce yourself. And my name is Jenna McCamus and I'm one of the nurses um, that helps coordinate and perform the aspirin desensitizations here with Dr. White. We've been doing this for many years together. Our clinic has a long history of doing um, aspirin desensitization, so we get a lot of referrals. And our goal today is to try to go over some of the most common questions that we hear. And so if this is um, something new that you've heard that you may have been diagnosed with, uh, we hope you can get some good information here. So uh, a couple questions that I was going to cover first. Um, the first question we get a lot of uh, is uh, what causes AERD to occur? So that's a really uh, complicated question. We know that this is something that often will um, come up in an, uh, later in adult life. And so even though someone may have a childhood history of allergies or asthma, that really doesn't make it more likely for them to have AERDs. So a lot of patients will just describe getting a bad cold or some sort of event, maybe in their 30s or 40s, and that seems to be a trigger, at least in about half of the people. So we think maybe in some people there's a virus or some sort of environmental cause, but other than that, we really don't have any good ideas. We don't think that this is um, something that you're born with. It doesn't really run in families, except in very rare cases. Uh, so the short answer is we really don't know why it occurs, um, and that's something that's uh, an area of a lot of research. The other uh, question is, is will this go away? Since it seems to have started without any, um, you know, real obvious trigger or cause, you know, is there a chance that it could go away over time? And so, unfortunately, the answer to that is probably no. We see people who have AERD who've had it for 10, 15, or 20 years, and we don't have any really good um, scientific studies that let us know that there's a chance that it could go away. There's always some, you know, specific uh, patient anecdotes or reports that make us think it's possible in a, in a rare situation that it might go away. But unfortunately, for most people, this seems to be something that they're going to struggle with lifelong once, once it develops. And then uh, the final point is uh, just what are the main treatment options? So patients often get diagnosed with this condition and then there's this kind of uh, somewhat overwhelming um, uh, inability to try to understand, you know, what are the options here for treatment? And a lot of the treatments for, for AERD are somewhat unusual. And so I'm just going to cover the, the main categories and then uh, as we go on later, we might talk about those more specifically. So. Uh, surgery is going to be one of the options for treatment, so uh, having an uh, ENT surgeon go in and remove polyps, open up the sinuses. Another treatment is going to be some of the um, medicines that block some of the mediators, so uh, things like monolucast you may have heard of, and there's a variety of others. One of the things that's unique for AERD would be aspirin desensitization. And then finally, there's a lot of new uh, injectable medicines called biologics. So in general, for patients, their treatment's going to be um, focused on uh, one or more of those pathways as we move forward. Jenna, one of your jobs is you're the first person to interact with a lot of these patients when they call in. And so can you go over, we'll go over some of the questions that, that are uh, most common that they'll ask you. Absolutely. Um, I'd say the number one question I get asked is, what is the success rate of aspirin desensitization? Okay, so um, that's a somewhat difficult uh, question to answer, which is just give an absolute number. I think some of this, um, uh, you know, is going to be patient dependent and what they're looking for, because obviously success for one patient might be different from success for another patient. But we know that in general, if you look at medical studies, about 80% of people who are taking aspirin are uh, get improvement and feel better. The question would be, you know, is the improvement that you get um, enough to have you call it a success? Because that's a bit different than when we look at it in a medical study. 
But overall, if you look at symptoms, if you look at studies that look at polyp recurrence, need for steroids, all of those particular items, about 80% of people who are on uh, aspirin treatment will have benefit. Some of those patients, it might be very dramatic, and in some of the patients, it might be more modest. They are improved, but they don't necessarily have, you know, all of their symptoms recover. Good. And um, another common question is, what is the risk of taking such a high dose of aspirin every single day? So that's a really good question. Uh, everything we do in medicine has some risks and benefits. And so all of our decisions really should be, um, you know, considered in the, the risks and the benefits for that specific patient. So uh, aspirin, though, has some common side effects most people know of. It can cause uh, stomach upset. That's probably the most common side effect that people deal with. So after, you know, a couple weeks or a few months, they may really feel like they have a sour and uncomfortable stomach. And some patients do stop aspirin treatment for that reason. The other uh, less common but still potentially severe are uh, stomach ulcers. So long-term aspirin or any uh, pain reliever medicine like in that category can lead to a stomach ulcer. In that situation, the aspirin would have to be stopped. And then um, probably the biggest risk that people worry about would be bleeding. And that's been in the news recently because there's been some changes in the recommendation for, for patients that want to take aspirin for heart. And it does turn out that, you know, that there is an increased risk of uh, severe bleeding. It's rare, fortunately, and we're um, not aware that that's a significant risk that's worse in the AERD patients than in the general population. But those would be the risks. Uh, those are risks that need to be discussed with your physician as you consider going on treatment. But if you consider that in a you know, significant amount of patients with AERD, the aspirin actually lets them not need surgery anymore, improves their quality of life dramatically, then in those patients, the benefit probably outweighs the risk. But those would be the, the discussions that you should have with your doctor. Good. And how does surgery fit into the overall treatment plan for these patients? So if you have this disease, if you have AERD, um, it's likely you already have had surgery. Most patients uh, have had surgery before they refer, uh, they get referred to an allergist. So uh, number one, um, if the surgery has been recent and the sinuses are relatively cleared out, that's a great time to add in aspirin treatment or some of the other medicines that we might use. When um, patients have a really blocked up nose that's full of polyps, they uh, won't get as much benefit from aspirin. When we put patients on aspirin, the main goal is to actually control symptoms and prevent polyp formation. And so if the nose is full of polyps, uh, the aspirin may not be effective in getting enough symptom resolution. So for us in our practice, and I know people do it differently, but our practice is if the patient really is fairly significantly affected by polyps, having uh, the polyps removed by a surgeon and then immediately doing aspirin desensitization within a month or two afterwards seems like the best combination. So uh, that's what we generally recommend it's not absolutely necessary to go through that path, but uh, that's the, our general recommendation to try to get the best uh, bang for your buck. Perfect. And um, what if a patient decides that desensitization isn't best for them or they're unable to go through it? Are there any other options? Yes. Um, so I try to make that point with all of my patients that are referred specifically to undergo aspirin desensitization. Because that's just one treatment here. It's unique for AERD, so we do want to offer it. And it can be very effective. It's obviously inexpensive to take aspirin every day. So uh, that would be one of our first choices. But it doesn't have to be the first choice. And some patients uh, have their own reasons and or their own medical issues that would make us not want to do aspirin desensitization. So there's, there's multiple other options. So uh, we... We always will focus on treating the nose and the polyps with the topical steroids, and that can be done a few different ways. Um, many of you probably have been instructed to use sinus rinses, and so there's various ways that steroids can be added into the rinses. That's a very common core treatment that we use. 
There's medicines like uh, montelukast, and montelukast blocks one of the chemicals that we know is really involved in the ERD, and that can be helpful for patients. Those treatments are relatively easy and uh, uh, relatively inexpensive. And then there's a few others that we also use. There's a medicine called Xyluton, which is an oral pill that you take. And that one also blocks a lot of the chemicals that are used in AERD. It is a bit more expensive, and in terms of insurance coverage, it might be a bit more of a challenge, but that's a, a good option for patients to try that aren't interested in uh, being on aspirin. And then finally, we have uh, a whole new category of medicines. They're um, injectable medications called biologics, and they all have their own uh, pathway that they target, and some may be more appropriate for patients than others. But in general, those medications probably can also be effective for the various parts of AERD, whether it's the asthma or the polyps. So all of these options are available. They all have pros and cons, and uh, those are a big part of the medical decision-making or discussion that you should have with your doctor after you consider all the risks and benefits. So um, my question for you, Jenna, we uh, have a lot of patients that come into our clinic, and as I just mentioned, there's a lot of different treatment options that we can use. Some of these are relatively easy to get, but we know that unfortunately some of them are a bit harder to get through insurance, and sometimes the aspirin desensitization is um, just somewhat of an unusual procedure to try to get insurance approval and have everything set up beforehand. So can you just walk us through for aspirin desensitization, what kind of your pathway is from the patient's first call to our clinic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so typically if you have an HMO, you need a referral to come see us anyways. Um, usually those doctors have no problem giving us referrals for the consults and then any treatment. Um, I've had a couple um, offices just ask, or if maybe if they're not as familiar with the desensitization, more information from you first, um, which we have no problem providing. Um, if it's a PPO plan, we usually don't need any prior authorization, but I will give patients the opportunity to call their insurance with all the codes we bill for to check their coverage. Um, just to make sure they know what they're responsible for. Every plan is a little different in terms of how much they cover. Um, and I've also had a couple people come back to me and say they need to show that this is medically necessary. And in that case, we've written them very nice letters, which insurance has gladly accepted and covered for patients. So those are typically the two routes patients okay. will go through. Um, and then, of course, if insurance just doesn't want to pay for it at all, there's always the self-pay option, which we'll offer to patients as well. And would you say that one of the kind of core things that we would want patients to do is to call their insurance themselves? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, they'll never tell me coverage, what a patient's responsible for, or give me numbers. Um, they'll just tell me if I need a prior authorization or not. So I highly encourage patients to always call. And typically when I start going over the prices, how much you could possibly get a bill for, that usually will mm -hmm. we'll do the trick. And patients will call insurance with that. Um, so similar question, these other medics, medicines that I mentioned that we use, the, they are uh, very expensive in terms of insurance coverage. And so one of the things that we need to do up front is if we think it's a medically appropriate medication is then really figure out how to make it accessible for the patient. And so that's also something that Jenna works with. So there's, there's a variety of these. There's actually five that we have right now that are uh, called biologics. So if Jenna, if I were to write a prescription today for a patient, can you go through what generally the next steps are for that? Yeah, uh, first step, no matter what biologic it is, is to get a benefits investigation from your insurance. Um, this will just let us know how much you're responsible for, how much insurance will pick up, um, what your pharmacy benefits are versus your medical benefits, and if we need a prior authorization to go through either or. Um, obviously, our office will always go with whatever is going to be the most cost-effective for the patient. 
information. Um, sometimes we don't have an option depending on the insurance plan um, and the drug. Um, sometimes we have to go with either pharmacy or medical benefits. Um, and once we get all that figured out and we do the prior authorization, um, hopefully we get the approval and at that point we can go over benefits with the patient and let them know if they will have a copay and in that case get them any copay assistance um, and go from there. What would you want to tell a patient if they you know, initially get an approval notice but then find out that they have a pretty high cost that they're going to have to pay each month? Um, a lot of the biologics do offer a lot of good programs um, and financial assistance. Unfortunately, that takes a lot um, of work from the patient, though. That's kind of where the nurses can't do as much work. Um, I know a lot of the, the uh, companies that work with these biologics need this, your proof of income, stuff like that, to see if you're eligible for any kind of assistance. Um, our office does have good luck getting that assistance for patients, but unfortunately, sometimes it just doesn't work out. And in that case, um, we'll go to plan B and see if there's something else we can do for them. Um, yeah. Good. And um, just to clarify, so for these medicines, does the patient, after they get it approved, do they go to their local pharmacy and pick it up? Uh, no. Most of the biologics, um, you do have to come into the office to get them. Um, there is Dupixent, though, however, which you can get at home, um, and the pharmacy works with you to get that delivered to your house. All right, great. So um, I know one other question that we had talked about earlier that sometimes patients um, are unaware of is if they're on aspirin, is the desensitization that they do here in the office the only treatment, or do they stay on it long term? And uh, a lot of our patients are surprised when they find out that aspirin treatment is meant to be long term. All of these treatments, if we find something that's effective, are meant to be long term. So none of these medicines, unfortunately, do you take for a month or six months and then stop because we don't have a way to cure uh, AERD. We, we really just have a way to control it or ways to control it. And so, you know, when you're thinking about the treatment that's best for you and you're talking with your doctor, just make sure that you understand that any of these are meant to be long term. And so that should be part of your decision making. If you're worried about side effects, you're going to be worried about long term side effects as well. Um, so. The last question I have for us, um, I'll ask you, Jenna, and then I'll answer. So what do you think is the most important thing to want a new patient to know about AERD? Um, well, you kind of brushed up on just knowing that everything is going to be long term. Um, nothing is short term, unfortunately, when it comes to AERD. And I feel like kind of what you just said um, led into the next point, which is that it just takes a lot of doctors, it takes a lot from the patient to collaborate to get this under control um, and to treat. Um, it is a big team effort and typically most of our patients, well, it's us, it's primary care, it's ENT, it's um, a good bit of doctors that have to work together in order to get the patient the proper treatment. So um, can require a lot of doctor's appointments, it can require a lot of follow-ups. Um, but we've seen awesome stories and success, I mean, huge success stories where when everybody does work together, it's usually a very good outcome for the patient. Yeah, I would agree. This is uh, not just a one size fits all approach when we treat this. And that's true with most medical illnesses. We know we have a list of things that we know can be effective, but we don't have one blood test that will just tell us which medicine's going to be. Um, the, the best one for a specific patient. And so it often requires a lot of teamwork with, especially with ENT, because we really need them to help surveil what's going on in the sinuses and help us understand if there's early polyp recurrence and the role for surgery. And then, um, you know, talking back and forth about whether we think that, that there's a failure of the medical treatment. And then we also really need the, the patients, you, to be proactive and, you know, really 
being honest about whether this treatment's working for you. There's a lot of uh, side effects, or, or I'm sorry, a lot of symptoms that um, really are just low-grade chronic symptoms that I think a lot of patients learn to live with. And we don't necessarily want that to be the case. We want you to, you know, reach out to your doctor and say, you know, I'm still struggling with these symptoms. I'm still needing, you know, steroid bursts or whatever, and see if there's other ways that we can really try to optimize your management. So I think we covered all the questions we uh, thought would be good for an introduction to AERD. We uh, hope that you'll reach out to your local physicians who are managing this and you can have a little bit more information in terms of the questions that you might want to ask them. Um, I also just want to make a plug for research. There's a lot of centers around the country now that are doing research in AERD. And so uh, there's some options for you to potentially be involved in actually furthering the, sci uh, the science here. So uh, you can look into those or talk to your local physicians. Thanks so much for watching.